Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm so excited. We have a very special guest today. We have Russell Reynolds on the show. Russell Reynolds is the founder of Russell Reynolds Associates, the global executive search firm, as well as RSR Partners. Russ, welcome to the show. Thank you, Will. Uh, Russ, it's such a thrill to speak with you. You founded one of the largest executive search firms in the world, Russell Reynolds Associates, grew 23% per year for 20 years, which is an incredible record. You, you left Russell Reynolds Associates in the early 90s and started another firm, uh, RSR Partners. Um, but I was wondering if we could start by, take us back to 1966, which I think is when you started an executive search and Paint us a picture of what executive search was like uh, in the 60s. Okay, thank you. Maybe I should give you a little background. I um, was born and raised in Greenwich, the descendant of farmers who worried about the weather and crops and worked very hard. Um, I was an only child, so I didn't have some of the input that some people have. I was raised in a Christian family where I was taught that I was not as important as certain other things. And um, I went to private schools in Greenwich and then Exeter and Yale, and then I was in the Air Force for three years as a navigator, bombardier in Strategic Air Command. I had been hired by J.P. Morgan and returned to J.P. Morgan when I got out of the Air Force, worked there for six or seven years, loved it, um, made some fantastic contacts, got married while I was in the Air Force, and um, when I got married, I was 24, and my wife was 22, so we started a family early, and um, fortunately, they're very much around. Anyway, working at J.P. Morgan and not coming from a wealthy family, I was slightly restless, slightly ambitious, and slightly ready for a change. I had a friend from Yale who was a uh, very interesting guy who joined a small executive search firm on Madison Avenue. And I became very intrigued in the business and ended up joining that firm, which was called William Clark Associates. Shortly after I got there, I became a big producer. And I felt that the other partners of the firm were frankly not the best people to recruit executives because they weren't the best executives themselves. I tried to get Bill Clark to let me hire a bright young assistant, comma, but he he didn't think that was fair to the other people. And I thought it should be a meritocracy and not a democracy. So I was frustrated and left. And I went racing over to my best friend, O.B. Clifford's house in Mount Kisco, and he was at McKinsey, and <clears throat> told him of my frustrations. And he said, well, what are you going to do? You quit. And I said, yeah, I'm so upset. I think I'll just have to start my own firm. And um, I did, and O.B. put up a little money, and a couple of our other friends did. We collected about $50,000 and started Russell Reynolds Associates. I also thought I was going to be so successful that I would need a partner 
so I could be on vacation sometime. So I persuaded my good friend Lee Getz to join us, and he did, and we um, had a very good partnership. I was the accelerator, he was the brake, and it worked very well. Anyway, the firm got started in 1969, and um, uh, it's uh, still going strong. It certainly is one of the largest search firms. Uh, you said that you're a big producer, uh, and then it didn't sound like you had necessarily uh, a lot of mentorship to you know teach you those skills. What? How did you manage to become a big producer? What was your approach to client development? <clears throat> it's not client development. It's um, client. Um, the, the, the trick to being successful in a service business is to do a good job. And I was young at that point. I had a lot of great contacts and maybe a pretty good judge of people. So um, one day I was doing a search for White Weldon Company, which was a very blue chip investment bank for a chief financial officer and somebody told me that the best person on Wall Street was the then um, head of finance at Oppenheimer and Company. So I called him up, had lunch with him, and he said that his base salary was um, fairly low, but his bonus was extremely high and that they needed people at Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer, um, he introduced me to Leon Levy, who was the senior partner of Oppenheimer and we bonded and became great friends. And um, over the years, we recruited a great many people for Oppenheimer. So it was through doing a search that I got a new client. And it was through that client that I got a lot more clients. And if you do good work and know how to connect with the client, the business will follow. You're obviously being quite modest when you say that you're a moderately good judge of people. Uh, you're clearly one of the you know best ever. What are some of the things that some of your practices for judging talent? What do you think that you look for that other people might miss? Um, it's pretty simple. Um, when I meet somebody, do they look you in the eye? Do they have a good smile? Do they seem happy? Do they seem well adjusted? Do they seem positive or negative? Are they anxious or excited about the future? I look for people who are well adjusted. And um, we recently, and ours, our partners, <clears throat> gave our first annual Russell Lewis Reynolds Jr. Chair of the Year Award to a woman named Sarah Nash, who um, has had an incredible career. And I looked her in the eye when I met her, and I said, what is the single most important ingredient for success? And she didn't even blink. And in one word, she said, integrity. And I couldn't agree more. And um, we, we're living in an environment today where integrity is not even a recognized word in the government and in many circles. But I think if people are honest and try to do the best they can, that they will prevail. I'd like to talk about some of the 
ways that you went to work to build the institution of Russell Reynolds Associates, your, the first firm that you started. Um, and I'm taking some of my questions from the book by Charles Ellis, uh, who wrote What It Takes, Seven Secrets of Success from the World's Greatest Professional Services Firms. Um, one of these, the first one is mission. What did you do to create among your team that you hired an overarching sense of purpose? You know, honestly, it's very hard for me to answer that question. Maybe you should ask the other people. But I definitely have and still have, I think, a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment, and a sense of responsibility. You've got to worry about your clients on nights and weekends and when you're out sailing. Um, you really have to make sure that everything that can be done for them is being done. You have to have a service mentality. And another thing I look for in people are, are they a giver or a taker? And um, if you have a service mentality and if you are in the right environment, you will be repaid without asking for it. When you were recruiting team members for your firm, what you know, you, you mentioned some of the things you looked at, you know, shake hands, smile, look you in the eye, they feel adjusted, but were there questions that you'd ask to help get a sense of, you know, does this person have integrity or does this person, is this person going to, you know, adapt to our style of client service and be, you know, that focused on putting the client first? Like, how would you screen for that? Well, <clears throat> um, one thing I always did was to ask for samples of their writing. Um, because communicating is so important. And there are a lot of graduates of great schools who don't know the difference between me and I. And um, I, <clears throat> I do. So communication skills are important. Um, I look for people who make a good impression. If for, you're the master of your own first impression and they need to be neat, clean, and uh, in reasonably good shape. I ask people, what are the three worst things that ever happened to you? And, and it's amazing the answers you get. Um, I also ask people um, about their family relationships and things that um, the woke movement may not approve of. But, but for example, what do you do on weekends? Um, and I, I used to ask people what their fathers did, but I don't anymore. Uh, in other words, to get to know them personally, because the resume says it all from a business point of view, but it doesn't say what kind of a person they are. You mentioned fitness. I mean, uh, it, how? Oh, excuse me. Yeah. But the the other thing I always did, and I still do, is if I'm thinking of hiring somebody. I get them off base. I play squash with them or tennis or take them sailing or at least have a meal with them. Because if they're in a room face to face, they're pretty well rehearsed. But if they're in different territory, it's easy to see how they really behave. And that is so important. I'm a huge believer in bright young people. And having been one myself a long time ago, I think that they are the key to success in a business because they're motivated, they're hungry, they want to please you. They don't have all the answers, they're receptive, and they get your motor going. Tell me a story about when you got someone out of that uh, 
face-to-face environment, when you went sailing with someone or played squash, uh, tell me a story about, you know, either someone that, uh, you know, when they revealed their true side, either that made them a particularly great hire or that you decided to pass on the person because they revealed something about themselves in that sort of environment. Well, on a squash court, you can tell a lot lot about a person. Um, Do they um, play to win or do they play to please you? If they play to please you, they're losers. If they play to win, they're winners, whether they win or not. Do they pick up the ball? Are they nice to the people around you? Um, And are they bright? And uh, I think being bright is primarily a question of common sense more than a question of formal education. It's instinctive. Um, I've had a number of disappointing experiences. Once I had a young assistant who visited me on our island in Maine, and um, he behaved very badly over the weekend and uh, in a social sense. And uh, on Monday, we had to fire him. And by the way, I'm having lunch with him today. We're still friends. <laughs> um, it's nice that you were able to stay stay in touch for a long time um, and stay friends. You know what? He apologized. Uh, he knew he was wrong. He was sorry. And I accepted his apology. So... One tip I'm hearing is get people out of the interview environment so you can see how they behave. Perhaps go for a walk, have breakfast, have a meal, play a sport. What are some other things, uh, other tips you have, other questions or ways to really uh, you know, get at um, the way someone's going to behave on the job and how, you know, how ambitious they are, for example? Well, one thing I was thinking about is that I never thought I was anything special. And um, I had self-confidence and a lot of spirit, but I I didn't have a a big ego. And uh, I found over the years that if I asked somebody to do something with me, I better be prepared for a positive response. So I became much more audacious and much more careful. And um, one time at Russell Reynolds Associates, we needed a new independent board member. And I was trying to think of somebody to get. And um, I asked the president of J.P. Morgan if he knew anybody who could be a good board member for the firm. And he said, well, what about me? And I couldn't believe that the president of J.P. Morgan would lower himself to be on the board of an executive search firm. So I jumped at it and it made me realize that the firm was much more appealing than I realized. And um, I added several more very um, interesting, successful people to the board, including John Loudon, who was the chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, and Philip Caldwell, who was the CEO of Ford Motor Company. And I I really had trouble believing that they would want to do that, but they were really terrific directors. So one point I would make is don't underestimate yourself. If you're doing well, uh, keep sticking your neck out and you may, you may be pleasantly surprised. Talk to me, since you brought up board members, talk to me about 
governance for a bit. How did you use that external board of advisors? What, what role did they play? Well, they were legal directors. And um, we ran the firm uh, somewhat like a public corporation. The board was uh, taken very seriously. And I used the board to, uh, for advice, which I genuinely respected. And um, if they felt strongly about something, we did what they thought. I uh, controlled the company pretty much until the day I retired from it in 1993 because I still had a big slug of stock. Plus, I was a trustee of the ESOP we had set up. So, um, but uh, I very careful listening to other people, depending on who you listen to. I'd like to hear about the institutions and practices that you set up to develop people. So I imagine in the very early days, you could be directly mentoring the people that you brought on board. But as the firm grew, you had to set up systems, I imagine, to develop uh, people. Could you talk about those systems? Well, uh, in all honesty, um, um, there was no formal thinking about setting up systems. Um, the firm grew through branch offices. Um, the first branch was in New York, which grew tremendously. The second branch was in London. The third branch was in Los Angeles because my wife was from there and she had a lot of good contacts from her family. And then the fourth branch was in Chicago, which I started with a exceptional man named Ferdinand Nadherny, who was a great Yale football player. And I left it to them to pretty much set their own pace. But we did have certain rules, like um, you have to introduce three candidates in the first month of a search or it won't be successful. Um, all candidates had to be original ideas, not from a data bank of people who were looking for jobs. All candidates had to be con good communicators and well checked out to make sure there were no embarrassments. <clears throat> so um, I was a big believer in having the right connections. And um, we encouraged people to belong to the best clubs in the town. We encouraged people to be involved in charitable and political and extracurricular activities because that's where you meet people. And I wanted the firm to be perceived as interactive in society. So, for example, one day I got a um, call from a woman in London who asked me if I would head up fundraising for the American Friends of the Mary Rose, which was an organization created in England to raise the wreck of the Tudor warship Mary Rose, which sank in 1545. And the president of the Mary Rose organization was then Prince Charles. So I told her that I was not important enough to do this myself, but I would try to get somebody at the right level. So I asked Walter Cronkite, David Rockefeller, and two or three others if they would do it. And they said no. So <clears throat> I got stuck with the job and became an acquaintance of 
the then Prince Charles, which was an extremely interesting experience personally, but also probably very good for the firm. And there were many cases like that where I got involved with uh, political campaigns and met an awful lot of interesting people. And um, uh, I did it, A, because I believed in it, but B, because I thought it would be good for the business. And I could go on. What sort of role did you play in political campaigns? Well... When my wife and I had our 25th wedding anniversary party in Greenwich, Prescott Bush asked me if I would chair fundraising for his campaign for the Senate. Um, I ended up doing that. He dropped out, but um, the Bush family became impressed with my fundraising skills. So uh, I ended up being very close to George H. W. Bush and later to George W. Bush through the Bush family. And I, I'd i already done a lot of work for um, Ronald Reagan, who I thought a lot of. But uh, today the um, candidates are not quite as um, idealistic as they were. <laughs> to put it mildly. Can you share any stories from uh, raising uh, funds for uh, George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush or George W. Bush? Well, Bush 41, terrific guy, great sense of humor. And one day I mentioned that I was going to China to explore opening an office in uh, Beijing. And he wrote a letter to the prime minister, which said, I would appreciate it, Mr. Prime Minister, if you would show Mr. Reynolds the same courtesies you have shown me and my family. And I thought that was pretty nice. So I was hosted in a reception in the great hall of the people and treated uh, very nicely. Didn't get much business, but it felt good. (laughs) So in terms of developing people, how then did you develop a Russell Reynolds way? If, um, you know, how did you get a consistent approach across the firm? About a year after I started the firm, I, had lunch with Lester Korn, who I knew, who had founded Corn Fury in Los Angeles. And he asked me to be an equal partner of theirs, uh, representing the East Coast and financial recruiting. And I had zero interest, but I told him that I appreciated it. And I said, what is your objective, Lester? And he said, oh, our objective is to be the biggest firm in the world. And I didn't say this, but my objective was was to be the best firm in the world. So today they're at around two and a half billion and they went public and all that. Um, Russell Reynolds is still a private company, still run by its internal stockholders and board, and they had a billion. And I'd rather have a billion dollars of quality than two and a half billion of, I wouldn't say not quality, but with a different attitude. Corn is a fine firm. Being in the people business and the talent business, tell us a bit about some of your practices over your life of maintaining and building relationships how would you you know stay in touch with people that you had served as a client at some point or had as a candidate at some point or just gotten to know through one of your political activities or or volunteer activities well it's extremely important to stay in touch with the client and you can assume nothing 
except that all your competitors are trying to replace you. So I, one thing I did with um, clients where we worked at the board level was I attended the annual meeting and um, usually had lunch with the board and they seem to appreciate that. I think it is imperative to make a personal call on a client at least twice a year, no matter how inconvenient it is. I think it is critical for a top level recruiter to meet with a client company periodically, but more often than not, they appreciate it. And um, they often don't think of it. So you, you have to initiate it, you have to be bold, and you have to have something to offer. Talk to me about product innovation. So in terms of how you, over the course of Russell Reynolds Associates, and we can go to RSR Partners, how did you develop new ways of providing value to your clients, new ways of serving them, new types of service offerings? The, uh, the search business is usually broken down into practice areas like healthcare, financial services, wealth management, consumer, industry, board recruiting, etc. And it's a good idea to get people who are experts in those fields and have had some experience in them. On the topic of practices, could you talk to me a bit about how you selected practice leaders and what sort of autonomy did they have? How did, how did you sort of organize your practices within the firm so they could you know, either be developing knowledge or um, training or client development? Um, t- talk to me about practice management. I think to build a service firm, you have to be opportunistic and take advantage of opportunities. In the search business, every single human being you meet, whether it's a baby or an old person, every single person you meet is somebody who can be either a candidate, a source of good ideas, or maybe a client. And you need to recognize that and play the game uh, accordingly. So in building practices, I would tend to be very opportunistic. If I ran into somebody at the railroad station who I liked, and they happened to be an expert in growing wheat, you, you might hire them because A, they meet your general criteria and B, they know a lot about something you know nothing about. And um, an awful lot of the growth of RRA came from opportunistic meetings and then following up on them. Things don't always go exactly the way you want to, so you have to be flexible. In 1993, you mentioned that you sold uh, your shares in Russell Reynolds Associates and uh, decided to go to the next chapter in your life. Talk to me about that decision. Well, in 1993, I was in my early 60s. I thought I would be able to exist if I didn't work. I had the world's best wife and three fabulous children. And by that time, grandchildren were beginning to appear. Uh, I had a wonderful life and a lot of outside interests. And in the firm, I felt that they were getting tired of me. I thought I heard, oh, there he goes again. You know, And um, I was very tired of being in the front of an airplane going to Singapore with a bourbon in my hands in first class. 
And I thought, if I never see another plane, it'll be too soon. On top of that, I had appointed one of the bright young people as CEO, and I was then chairman. And he and I did not have a good relationship. And I felt that it would be better if he took over and I departed. So it was not all positive, but in retrospect, <clears throat> I would do the same thing again. And then when I was um, in my early 60s and blessed with this great personal life and um, great health, I decided to start RSR Partners, which at that point was called the Directorship Search Group. And we were able to advise corporate boards, but I had a non-compete on executive search for 10 years. So in the beginning, it was just about boards and then it segued into executive search, which today is going quite well. I'm now chairman emeritus. I'm not directly involved, but I am on the board. So some people might have decided to just kind of permanently retire. What was it that drew you back and led you to start a new firm? Well, I believe if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. And um, anybody can sit around and clip coupons, play golf, go to Antigua, go to the best restaurants, enjoy the best wine. But as a descendant of Connecticut farmers, I was taught that being idle is not good. So anyway, I just felt that it was important to stay involved. I would love to hear your thoughts around, first, some career mistakes that you've seen people make over the decades. Perhaps there's some themes that you've seen people make in managing their careers. Well, one day I was going to our beautiful church in Greenwich, and I met a charming person who ended up joining my firm. And um, that person later betrayed me. And I felt that I had been duped in a graceful setting by a bad person. So I made a mistake. And I'm sure I've made many other mistakes. I often tend to be somewhat outspoken. So I tend to occasionally get my foot in my mouth, but I'm a big believer in honesty and direct conversation with people not going around their back. So, but in terms of the big business picture, I don't think there were that many mistakes because the offices we opened at RRA, and I think they're now almost 50, all turned out to be a good idea. Everywhere you go, people need better people. And um, the search business is a very simple concept. I meet you and I introduce you to the other person and I get a fee. It's quite simple. So you don't want to overcomplicate it. I also um, was misled by a couple of people at RRA who I believed. But, you know, the batting average is pretty good. You mentioned earlier one of the things that you looked for in candidates is, you know, general fitness. Talk to me about other characteristics that you have noted in people who are, you know, successful in managing their career. Is uh, physical fitness one of them? Someone who's, you know, active, it sounds like you are a squash yeah. player, a sailor. Do you see that's a common characteristic that people need to get some? Well, I, I may be a little prejudiced, but I am a big believer that if you're in good shape physically, you're probably in better shape mentally. So I look for people who have an athletic background, especially people who are in captain of teams, because that means they're a team player and not a soloist. I'm also wary of people who are academic achievers People who had a 4.0 average at a top school make me nervous because they're too interested in the intellectual side and not enough interested in the practical side or the fun side or the romantic side. 
So um, I looked for people who went to very good schools, but who were well-rounded and not nerds. That's so interesting. That's in some ways uh, counterintuitive that <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the summa cum laude a graduate is not necessarily the, um, the best one to put forward. No, and if they won three awards for intellectual achievement in AI, I would love to know them, but I'm not sure I'd hire them. You want people who get along with people. How much weight would you put on someone's past accomplishments versus what uh, seems to be their potential? Well, I think the track record is very important. And one thing that turns me off are people who have changed jobs every two to three years. We call them rolling stones and they gather no moss. And today, the younger people tend to be very, very resume conscious. And they tend to join a firm because it, quote, looks good, unquote, on their resume. Or it's a building block. So they go to McKinsey for a couple of years and then look for another job, or they work for uh, a financial firm and then want to shift. I look for people who make a commitment to me and to what I'm doing and want to make me obsolete because they're better. So I'm very worried today about the lack of values that people display. They're blatant self-serving, approach to things instead of their desire to please others. I hired somebody not long ago by putting an ad in the media. It was not for the firm. But anyway, I said, we wanted a team player, a giver, not a taker, a positive attitude, and it's all about the firm, not about you. And I said, if you don't have these qualities, please do not respond. I got 40 responses and hired an absolute star. So you, you, can, you can put words in other people's mouths and see how they uh, respond. If you're advising a young person today, say a recent college graduate, what advice would you give them if they say, Russ, I, you know, I want to keep developing my skills. What skills should I invest in? What would you suggest to them? And if they're thinking about anything from technical skills, you know, learning how to code or learning about AI versus learning to sell versus learning to negotiate versus learning to you know, write, what sort of skills do you think are going to be timeless and worth where you'd suggest people focus on their invest, investing? Well, I, I think it's very important to keep educating yourself. So I would encourage people to attend seminars, to attend conferences, to uh, listen to all kinds of podcasts or other ways of learning. But I also think attitude is extremely important. And the question is, John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country. And I um, recently told one of my grandchildren when they joined a big successful firm that she should aim to be the CEO of the company, not just a step on the ladder. And if you didn't feel that way about it, you shouldn't be there. But again, I think it's important to have a balanced life. I think vacations are critical and that people who don't take them are dumb. I think that family is critical relationships are critical and it's all part of a package of success. But as important as self-education is, I think being on outside boards, both charitable and for-profit can be extremely educational and helpful. So they, it all depends on the individual. And final question, any parting thoughts for someone who is building a professional services firm, whether it's a search firm or a consulting firm, other sort of professional service firm, what other tips would you share that you didn't already mention today? Well, in the first place, 
the sale starts when the customer says no. So don't take no for an answer. Secondly, you're limited only by your own imagination. You can get anything you want if you know how to go after it. So keep trying until you can't do it anymore. And the third thing is be grateful, be humble, be respectful, and recognize that you're not the most important person in the world, but you can help those who are. So it's a combination of things. And the most important thing of all is stay in good health physically and mentally. Russ, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Will. I really appreciate your interest. Stay well.